we're really very privileged tonight to have Bob Flint here to talk to us about a really important topic in the whole area of global health that uh, I felt needed to be included in this lecture series. I've heard him talk before, and I thought that what he had to say was something that would be really valuable for those of you attending this class here, and those of you from the community who haven't heard him on this subject before. So he's going to talk about uh, um, ancient wheat. Um, he's a farmer and president of Hamut International. And uh, beyond that, I'll let you handle the introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You know, they ask for bio sometimes, and then by the time they get done, you think you're at a funeral. And I hate, I hate those kinds. So anyway, that was just perfect. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm uh, actually a local boy from Big Sandy, Montana. I was raised there, went to school there, went to uh, Bozeman to receive my master's and master's, and then on to UC Davis and received a, um, a doctorate in plant biochemistry. And after a few years, I returned to the farm, and now my whole farm is my laboratory. And so I'm really loving that. Um, in the winter, I travel uh, most all over the world um, uh, promoting um, ancient grain and organic agriculture. Uh, in the summer, I'm home farming as much as I can. Um, for example, last week I was in um, St. Petersburg at the Babelhof Institute, which housed the largest seed collection in the whole world. So I was doing some experiments with them. And so um, things have really opened up opportunities to me in ways I would have never imagined. Uh, just starting with a handful of wheat that I'm going to tell you about. Um, so, if I can make this thing work, how does it work? Is it push? There it goes. <laughs> I thought it would be good to start out with a few health lessons from the ancient past. Um, from ancient Greek, uh, Greece, Hippocrates, now this is about 20, what, 23, 2400 years ago, said food should be our medicine and medicine should be our food. And now we're finally starting to get back to this idea. At least it's starting to be discussed. But it's something that we have really lost sight of for a long, long time. A third of the way around the world from Greece was ancient India. They have a um, proverb that said, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. And I thought that really struck a chord with what we're trying to talk about when we're talking about healthy food, um, creating healthy uh, populations. And if we go a little closer to home, my friends at Rocky Boy told me, um, good food is good medicine. So I thought that pretty well sums it up. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, boy, you really have to push this thing, huh? Yeah, you could also just push the... Well, okay, let me do the, the arrow thing. How's that? Okay, so we're going to talk about using wheat as a model, um, the importance of good food for good health. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, I'd like to start out by telling you a little bit about the wheat family in general. It's divided into three categories based on the number of chrom chromosomes in the wheat plant. And if it gets to be too much science, you just raise your hand, but there will be a test afterwards, right? So, that's, okay. So, there, it, for wheats that are diploids, that means they have one set of chromosomes from each parent. That's like us. That's like most of the animal world and everybody. Um, an example of that is einkorn. It's about the only group, uh, wheat out of that group, that's commercially available and known anything about. Tetraploids have two sets of chromosomes from each parent. And uh, examples of that is emmer, durum, which is, of course, used for pasta, very well known throughout the world, and um, coruscant wheat, which is the grain that we're um, working with, and it's a very close relative to durum. Bread wheat is found and spelt are found in the hexaploid group. They have three sets of chromosomes from each parent, um, giving them six, and um, they are the most complex of the uh, wheat family. So, there's a big buzz around the country right now. You can't avoid it anywhere you hear wheat free, gluten free at every, every bar, every cocktail party. Uh, the stores are full of it. So, is wheat really bad for you? Let's look at the history a little bit. Ancient civilizations, wheat was considered the staff of life. Um, it was a builder of great civilizations, starting with Babylon, Egypt, Greece, Rome, the Ottoman Empire, parts of India and parts of China. This is thousands and thousands of years. If wheat is that bad, how could that have happened? How could it have been the main food for these great civilizations without them just deteriorating into um, diabetes and heart disease and everything that we see today? So something, just the history tells you that wheat, by its very nature, cannot be that bad. 
It cannot be evil, but it's, it's, it's paint, painted as today. Heritage wheat, just loosely defined as that wheat which was grown or developed before World War II, also produced really no serious signs of health um, trouble or health consequences. It's still with our daily bread. Um, wheat from the modern era were um, selected from wild wheats, um, the most popular in the West, in, in Montana, for example, the most popular wheat from 1916 when the homesteaders first came in and settled to um, after World War II, about 46, was Turkey Red. That wheat brought, was brought from Ukraine into Kansas in the 1880s by Ukrainian immigrants and spread throughout the um, wheat belt. It was a very good wheat for our area. In Canada, they had a wheat called uh, Red Fife. And again, that was from Ukraine, and it spread throughout Western Canada. It was their most popular wheat for almost um, uh, 60 to, well, almost, almost, almost 100 years, from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. Um, the wheat selections that began before World War II were quite simple. Either there were selections out of a, of a land race. A land race means that it's not a pure... Um, a variety of wheat, but made up of very many closely related varieties or lines. And this was done to give stability to the grain. This is how um, ancient farmers first developed their cultivation of wheat. They just didn't get one line because if the grasshopper, or some bug came in and was susceptible to that and killed it all out, they'd have a famine. But if they had lots of lines, it's some different in susceptibility to um, different environmental attacks, different insects or disease attacks. The idea was that they still have something left in the field that would be harvestable. And so stability, um, or diversity begets stability. And that's really an important principle. And it's not only in cropping systems, it's in societies, it's in your clubs, it's in everything. The more diverse it is, the more stable it is. Business, it's all the same principle. So the early selections came then such as Cheyenne or simple crosses such as Logo um, were just made with uh, two different strains and just looking for a better, um, more yielding. In the case of uh, Yogo, they're trying to get more uh, winter hardiness and that sort of thing. Um, so Heritage Week was really the mainstay of the Americas, uh, North America at least, and, and Europe for hundreds of years. Uh, so again, um, can't, maybe you can't say it built our civilization, but we certainly did well on it for a couple hundred years. How can then now we say that um, the wheat's suddenly bad for you? What has happened? Um, modern wheat, uh, daily bread started to become deadly bread for many people. And um, for example, we have um, at least 1% that have celiac disease, 1% with severe allergies to wheat, um, those numbers are continuing to grow. We have 12 to 20 percent that are non-celiac um, wheat sensitivities that have all kinds of maladies from just um, headaches to bloating to skin rashes to something that is, is a problem with wheat. Um, we also have an explosion in non-infectious uh, chronic diseases such as heart disease, IBS, diabetes, fatty liver syndrome, and those sorts of things. Um, I don't believe that um, modern wheat is necessarily causing all that. There's many other, other causes that are working together to create the um, uh, incidence, the rising incidence of all these diseases, but it's certainly aggravating it. And I'll show you some research that supports that. So the modern wheat breeding goals, and this is coming from our government, which the main goal was that food in this country should be cheap and plentiful. In the days of ancient Rome, they had the same idea with bread and circus. The, the ruler said, if we keep the people fed cheaply and entertained, then they, they're busy and they don't have to worry about you know, thinking or revolutions or anything like that. So that's what's, what's going on. And, and we have a little bit of that same philosophy in this country, although we couch in food security too. So here's the main ways they did this. Increased yields, lower costs, and finally you have cheap um, white um, air bread in the, in the stores. So everybody wants to increase their yields. So on the farm, you've got um, plants that are made shorter, uh, more resistant to disease and insects. Um, they're connected with high input systems, lots of uh, chemical fertilizer like nitrogen goes on to produce um, higher volumes of wheat. Chemicals are used to control weeds. At the flour mill, we want uh, higher extraction of white flour so the brand is made harder to easily flake off. 
Um, and it's fed to the pigs when actually it should be something we should be eating to help our digestive system. Um, in the bakery, we ha want more low volume, so we are using now fast rising yeast that is acting so um, fast. Uh, well, the, more, the low volume is being created by changing the protein in the starch, but they're also speeding up the bread processing with fast rising yeast, which means the bread is rising so fast that it only has time, the yeast only has time to digest the sugar, turning that into carbon dioxide um, and alcohol told that the bread will rise up and go in the oven as fast as possible. Um, the store then wants to sell as much as possible for as cheap as possible, so they're interested in more sales. So let me show you some examples of on the farm experiments that we've done on our farm. I um, gathered together about um, 60 different varieties last year of winter wheat uh, to plant them over the winter wheat from the last hundred years. And this is just an example of eight um, or seven, seven varieties. And last year in, in 2016, we had an extremely wet year. So we had good yields. We had almost twice the normal rainfall. And so you see that starting with Yogo, it's a pre-World War II um, simple cross done at Montana State University. And then after that, after 1960, then the breeding programs really kicked in, and I've got a different variety for each decade, uh, more or less, from uh, 1960 to 2013. This war horse is the last, most recent to be released. This is showing you the, the decline in the height. Of course, this is just, it's not replicated, it's just a one-time thing, but it gives you still a feeling for what's going on. So, Yoga was by far the tallest wheat, it was 54 inches, and the uh, War Horse was by far the shortest. Um, if you look at the yields, so the, as, the, as the height is going down, the yields are going up. Um, it started at 31 and ended up at 57. Um, the protein, interesting enough, is, is also going down. Now, that's is not normally uh, what they're looking for. They're looking for high protein. But what, in my organic system, I'm not adding um, soluble nitrogen. If you add a lot of nitrogen, you're gonna see a big kick in protein here. And that would um, allow you to have enough nitrogen to produce 57 bushels an acre, which is a huge amount of wheat, um, and still have high protein. Because you need high protein for large low volumes. So if you look at the low volumes, and I'll show you in a minute how that's, how that's measured, but these are just relative numbers. You see the, higher, the highest protein gives you the, the highest low volume all the way down. Here's a low, the lowest um, protein is the lowest low volume. Um, and, that's not, and that's not good. Now, the, another thing that's going on with this war horse, that's a big difference of 10 bushel from genu to war horse, but this is very, we had a lot of disease last year, and this is very, very resistant. And so that made a big kick too in its, in its yield. So this is what the plant breeders are focusing on. This is the result. Um, and they're, so you can say it's a great success, right? Because that's, they, they accomplished their goals. Now, when you look at bread, um, the goal for the bakeries is to make more bread with less wheat. If you make more bread with less wheat, you can sell it for less money, you can make more money. Um, so again, the, the way they did that was to increase the gluten um, in, the, in the grain to change both the protein and the starch so that it made complexes in the dough that was, were more elastic and they were then able to hold more air. And as if the, if the loaf of bread can hold more air, it's going to be bigger and you can sell more air for the price of bread. This is great, huh? <laughs> um, if you ever want to have a little fun with your kids or your <laughs> classmates or something, go get a loaf of, of, of white, you know, air bread and then see how tight a ball you can, and you can smash that into. It's quite amazing. And then go down to some of the, 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 the um, heritage bakeries we have in town and get some of their uh, really good heritage breads and you're not gonna be able to do the same thing. Um, and uh, it's much more nutritious uh, what they're doing with the whole grains anyway. So probably the, um, the main reason I think and there's no direct evidence of this for, for sure, but I think the increasing disease and the digestive problems are coming probably from the change of the starch and the um, protein complex. The proteins are much larger, probably harder to digest, but the fast rising yeast um, has replaced low fer slow fermentations and sourdough, which took um, 12 to 24 hours to, um, to ferment the, the dough, and it was actually pre-digesting the protein so that when you ate it, 
the body was already eating something that was pre-digested, and it's very easy on your digestive system. Um, so sourdough is a very good uh, way to eat any kind, of, any kind of wheat and any kind of bread because of that. And the sourdough is also adding, according to what we see in our research, higher amounts of antioxidants because of the fermentation process. So the digestive system now is completely overloaded. Uh, if you, and if you're under stress or have a little bit of disease, that's going to show up more than if you're good, in good health. But it's still a strain on your system um, because we have complex gluten and it's not pre-digested that I just mentioned to you. So let me give you a little history of how we started out with our, our ancient grain. This turns back the clock 31 years to the first food show I ever went to in Anaheim, California. And you see I look a little younger then. That's um, me on the right. And uh, my parents were there helping me, and we had a great time. We didn't know anything what we were doing. We built our own booth. Um, we just showed up, um, put a few decorations around and a few signs, and we just were ready for business. And um, we had a flour mill. I had a flour mill in Fort Benton, and we were doing stone ground whole wheat flour using this mill from, um, it was a stone mill from Austria, from Austria in, in Austria. So it was kind of a great show and tell. And my dad had brought this little jar of ancient grain with him. It's a giant wheat. I have some in my hat. You can see it afterwards if you like. And uh, he was showing it to everybody, and finally after a thousand people went by in three days, one person said, oh man, that's just what I'm looking for. If you plant that, I'll buy everything you can produce. And we thought, wow, we could probably grow 20 or 30 acres of this, sell it by the pound, and um, probably be the most valuable crop we have. So we went home. We had 50 pounds in our shed that had been sitting there for four or five years, and we planted that. And then a friend of ours in California said, well, I've got a great idea for this. And he had um, a friend of his make pasta. And we handed it out to all, all of our friends. And this lady lived in Haver, and she couldn't eat any wheat at all. I mean, she'd get deathly ill. But she did kinesiology mus muscle testing. She could put something in her hand and then do a little muscle test. And she could figure or sense if it was going to be OK to try. So she sensed that it was OK to try. So she had some pasta. And then she called up the next day, and she said, what is this stuff? She said, well, not only could I eat it, but when I ate it, I felt better. I said, wow, well, we'll give you some more. So we gave her some more, and she gave some to her, her um, um, sister, who also couldn't eat any wheat without getting sick, and she could eat it. And after she'd eaten it for a couple of weeks, she was less allergic, or less, not allergic is not the right word, she's less sensitive to other foods that she'd been having trouble eating. So we said, wow, this is really, this is not just a novelty. We were told this came out of the King Tut's tomb, and it was just kind of a novelty. But um, this is really something special. So I decided we need to take good care of this and um, market it in a way that, that, that preserves its identity. So we decided to, to um, register a trademark, because we were told, as I mentioned, it came from ancient Egypt. And I thought, well, I wonder what the ancient Egyptians called wheat. So I went to a dictionary and found wheat was called kamut in ancient Egyptian language. And so we trademarked that because it's a dead language and no one was speaking it, so we can make a trademark. And um, sometimes people kind of get mixed up with why we trademark and what the meaning of trademarks are. It doesn't mean that we own the grain. That's not what a trademark does. It's not a patent. It is a, a quality assurance identification that tells people um, that certain promises are being made in relation to that trademark. And in our case, um, the Kamut trademark means that we have a product that's always pure ancient wheat. No modern wheat is ever mixed, certainly not any GMOs. We're totally opposed to GMOs. We think that's, um, when we're already going in the wrong direction, why do we want to go faster with GMOs? That's how I look at it. And uh, if we're going the wrong way, you don't want to get there faster. Um, that's when we need to change our direction. And that's not a change. Um, it has certain health benefits, which we guarantee. It's always organically grown, which we guarantee. And then we make all of our customers tell the truth about it, which is kind of novel in some um, areas. Um, the best area to grow this grain is, and we've, and we've done experiments all over the world, is in Montana, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. And um, this year, after 31 years, starting with a half an acre, we're looking at 100,000 acres that are contracted with about 250 organic farmers in this region, and then slopping a little bit over into other areas um, uh, bordering us. So this is what happened after 12 years in America. The first really successful product was 
made by Arrowhead Mills, and it's still, I guess you can get it on, on Amazon.com, but it's, um, it's kind of run its course, but it's still my favorite cereal, and it's called Just Kamut Flakes, and, and it was made by Arrowhead Mills, who was the leading uh, manufacturer of organic cereals at the, in those days, and within about five months, it went to their number uh, two seller right after Corn Flakes. And after that happened, then all these copycats came on, so Kamut became known as a cold cereal in America, in the kind of in the, in the industry. Um, but when we went to Europe, um, they have a completely, they don't eat much cold cereal in Europe. Uh, they eat bread and pasta. And it made wonderful bread and wonderful pasta. And uh, those were the first European products. And because of, people imagine this, when you're eating cold cereal, how often you eat cold cereal? Maybe two or three times a week. Um, and maybe not that much in the wintertime. In Europe, they're eating bread and pasta two or three times a day. And so right away, the potential for, for growth is huge in Europe compared to America. This is what our growth has looked like over the last uh, few years. We can't hardly keep up with the demand. But right now, um, as I mentioned, we have the, the 200 growers uh, throughout the, the region here in Montana, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. But 75% of everything we produce goes to Italy. 10% um, to the rest of Europe, 8% to Canada, and the United States is only seven. They're still mostly eating cold cereal, although we have a few other products now. We're selling to 800 different processors and manufacturers, and there's over 4,000 products now in the world, uh, in, the, in stores throughout the world. Mostly, uh, most of those 90% are in Italy. They have a great appreciation for their food, and they take it real serious, and they think that this is a grain that they once had has been lost and now has been reintroduced to them. And so they love the taste. And for an Italian to say this is the best pasta they've ever eaten, that is an amazing uh, compliment. And so that's what's happened to us. Um, so in the last six years, we've done a lot of research to establish the connection between ancient wheat and good health. We've published over 20 papers now in scientifically peer-reviewed journal articles uh, or journal publications, and they're, and they're real high-level um, European um, Journal of Nutrition, um, the British Journal of Nutrition, and, and other journals that have a very high rating, and not just in some back room on an internet publication somewhere. Um, the last seven have been, well, most of this research recently has been done with, in Bologna and the University of Bologna and University of Florence Research Hospital in Italy. I went to Italy because I couldn't find anybody in America that wanted to work with me. When I first started looking for researchers about 20 years ago, um, I was told wheat is wheat, um, your wheat's no different than anybody else's wheat, uh, you're just wasting your time, your money, and our time and your money. That's kind of how it was. And I said, well, what about all the people that tell me they feel better? Oh, it's just in their head, they said. So that was the way it, it was 20 years ago. It's a little bit different now. Um, a lot of people are recognized for the trouble that they have eating modern wheat. So the last seven studies have been on living systems. We did three papers on a rat study. Uh, we've, done, uh, we've published uh, papers on human, healthy human subjects, on um, irritable bowel syndrome, on cardiovascular disease, on diabetes. We just finished a study on um, non-alcoholic fatty liver syn syndrome and obesity. And now we're looking at the last major study um, is going to be on dementia. All of these are connected with inflammation, as I'll show you. And uh, we're hoping now with all these papers to be able to come to America. There's some interest at um, Harvard um, that I've talked to about gathering together a, a consortium in America to apply for some um, bigger grants to do some bigger studies and not just with um, Kamut, um, of course, on wheat, but also looking at other ancient grains, comparing it to modern wheat and really seeing what's going on. If you can imagine, well, I'll show you here before you start imagining things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had one rat study and we got three publications out of it. The reason we started with rats is because that's all I could afford. And, um, um, and that was the truth. Um, and what we're looking at is an antioxidant capacity um, designation. We knew that the uh, Kamut brand course on wheat had much higher uh, selenium uh, in it. It took up selenium two or three times in a higher rate than modern wheat for some reason. The metabolism is different. So they've changed the metabolism. They've changed so many things in the breeding program that they don't know 
what they have changed because they're only looking at one thing. They're looking at either yields or, or blow volumes. That's the main thing they look at. And they don't look at these other things. But one of the things that's also been lost is the ability to, to absorb a lot of minerals. And um, this is absorbing selenium at a high rate and it has enough selenium in it that three helpings a day gives you 100% of your daily selenium requirement. There's almost no other food that, that can say that in America. Um, there's some nuts that are very high, like Brazil nuts. But um, we knew that selenium is a very strong antioxidant, so I thought that that would be one thing we could demonstrate. So that was what we were looking for first, and we found that, that there was a significant difference in rats-fed modern wheat compared to rats-fed with um, ancient wheat in their antioxidant capacity. Now, the way you measure antioxidant capacity, in a rat at least, is you give them a shot of dox, which is a, a pretty strong chemical that used to be used in um, fighting cancer. And they don't use it anymore because it has a lot of side effects. One of the side effects is uh, creating a lot of free radicals, and that's what we're looking for. And we want to see how many of those free radicals then are, are, are reduced or, or um, um, uh, taken over by the diet and, and uh, reduced so that you have a, a, uh, an antioxidant capacity then number that you can put on those and compare them. Another thing that it does, then we didn't think about this because we no one had looked at it before, but it causes inflammation. And that's another reason they don't use it anymore. It causes a lot of inflammation. And um, one of the researchers just happened to be looking at some of the, the rat's um, lymph nodes and um, uh, pancreas and some of those uh, type of organs, and they found that the kamut fed rats didn't have any inflammation. And the, and the ancient or the modern wheat fed rats had the normal inflammation you'd expect when you would use the DOCS injection. So it was protecting against inflammation, it was anti inflammatory. And this has never been reported before. No one had imagined such a thing. We certainly didn't. We weren't looking for it. But we stumbled onto it. It was a fantastic discovery because it led to, to changing the direction of our research completely. Then the, about this time, the Wheat Belly book came out. I don't know how many of you, how many have read the Wheat Belly book? A few? Okay. Well, anyway, it's a, it's a terrible blast against wheat, saying all wheat is terrible. And it really one of his main... Um, uh, statements is that wheat causes inflammation, and that's one of the problems with it. So after reading that more than once, and I called up the author and talked to him, Dr. Uh, Davis, and we had a big discussion, and I thought, well, I wonder if my rats can show this. And so I called up my friends in Italy, and I said, could we be so lucky to still have some of the rats in the freezer? And they said, oh, yeah, we have everything. And, um, and so I said, well, great, go down and find the rats in our controls, the one that didn't get the shot, and see what they are looking like, the, the wheat, modern wheat compared to the ancient wheat-fed rats. And so they did that, and they went down and they compared those two rats, and what they found was a modern wheat diet causes inflammation in the spleen and the lymph nodes and the villi were shortened and distorted, and so they could see many of the things that Dr. Davis was talking about in his Wheat Belly book that we were confirming other research that had been done. So this isn't anything new. But what was new, that there was absolutely no evidence of this with the rats that had been fed, the ancient wheat, that also were in the control group not receiving the dock shot. So this was also never been reported before and, a, and quite an astonishing um, finding. So because of the tie that we, most people, understand very readily that inflammation is tied to chronic disease. We started thinking now we'll look at human studies and see if we can see something similar. So our first human study was actually with um, uh, those people who are healthy but uh, at risk for, for um, heart disease. So they had elevated cholesterol but it wasn't to the point where it was being treated. Um, those sorts of things. And this tells all the particulars about the uh, people. They divide them into two groups. I'll show you, it looked like this. So it's called a single crossover study. Half the group ate ancient wheat for eight weeks, half ate modern wheat. Then there was a washout period for eight weeks and they switched. They didn't know what they were eating. Uh, they didn't even know what this experiment was about. They were only told, eat what we give you and don't buy any other wheat. Don't eat any other wheat than what we give you. And we gave them pasta, bread, crackers, flour, um, and um, crackers. Um, so that they could have a full range of wheat, wheat in their diet. And this is what we found in the first um, experiments with humans. 
the um, most striking results were the um, were the anti-inflammatory, but we also saw uh, components. We saw the total cholesterol um, drop, the LDL cholesterol went down even more, the um, potassium went up, so some of these minerals that are in the grain were showing up now in the blood as a more of an increase, and the magnesium was up. Um, the cytokines, these are cytokines at the very bottom, uh, and different types, and they are indicators of of inflammation. And so what we saw was there was a huge drop of 25 to almost 35 percent in the cytokines related indicating the levels of inflammation. And that was by far the greatest um, difference. And all the research that we've done since then we've seen in the same range of about 30 percent change. That is enormous change. The cholesterol changes and the other changes are in the range of um, eight to twelve percent is still significant, but it's not it's not it's not um, enormous like the uh, inflammation. Um, it also we could demonstrate over here on the on the right the um, uh, same thing we saw in the rats was an increase in the um, um, oxidative um, stress reduction with ancient wheat diet. Then we went to irritable bowel syndrome. This um, affects about 20% of the population in the Western world at some levels. Most people, or a lot of people don't, um, aren't affected by it, they don't lose work or anything. Maybe it's bloating, maybe it's some indigestion, some uh, cramps. Um, it can be diarrhea, it can be constipation, it can be all kinds of things, different things. Um, but it's related to what people are eating. And so again, um, we uh, did a, a crossover study, the same as before. People were told only to eat wheat that we gave them. Um, we told them a little bit of a fib. Well, it wasn't a cold fib. The placebo effect on these kind of um, experiments is huge. And um, we were afraid that people would think negatively <clears throat> and then make them themselves feel sick um, with the placebo effect. So we told everybody that we were going to give them different types of food and we thought that they were going to feel better. So we planted in their mind the idea that they would feel better. Um, all this was organic, so it probably was better than what they're eating anyway, so it wasn't a total lie. But um, we wanted to put in their mind something positive. Um, and this is what we saw, found, that every single person, and even though our, our, our study sample size are, are small, like 20 to 40, the consistency is so great that it really adds, adds more um, significance to the findings. So every single person, without exception, experienced 50 to 100 percent improvement in, in all their symptoms. Um, whether they were abdominal pain, whether they were bowel movement, uh, dissatisfaction, whether it's bloating, um, the bloating was uh, probably one of the ones that improved the, the most. Um, uh, less interference, the quality of life. So there's all very, very significant improvements with ancient grain diet and almost no improvements or no change. The, um, the lines were fairly flat with the, um, with the control of uh, modern wheat. Then we went to cardiovascular disease. And all these people that had um, signed up for this study or had been signed up at least had one heart attack. One guy had three. I said, oh my gosh, he's not going to die, is he? And um, luckily he didn't, but I was a little worried he had three heart attacks. But because they had heart attacks already, they were all on statins and all kinds of drugs that um, would prevent stroke and a further occurrence of heart attacks. And even though they were on statins, which of course reduces cholesterol, every single one of them, and I didn't bring all the charts for all these, but every single one of them dropped, had their um, cholesterol dropped um, another 8 to 10 percent. Um, the LDL cholesterol had dropped, the total antioxidant capacity increased, the um, reactive ox uh, oxygen species of lymphocytes and monocytes dropped, the markers for inflammation decreased about 30 percent, and again, as I mentioned to you before, that was the biggest, that was the biggest um, uh, difference, and the magnesium increased. So the overall um, health of these people with chronic heart disease was improved. It didn't cure it, it's not a cure-all, but instead of aggravating it and making it worse, it's helping them um, actually be better. And, and um, I think that's what's significant. Then we looked at diabetes. Diabetes, as you know, is running rampant in this country and, and um, many countries of the world growing 
more and more. Um, the Indian population, as you probably know, and we have several reservations in our state, are um, plagued by this disease. Um, <clears throat> and again, of course, it's your activity your goes, is a factor. Um, also, stress is a factor, and also your diet is a huge factor. We, when we compared, and we did the same kind of a uh, uh, crossover study, uh, double-blind study, the patients didn't know what they're eating, the scientists didn't know what was being passed out um, until after the data was in, and uh, we saw all the same trends that we'd seen in the previous studies. The blood glucose, in this case we're looking at things that really affect uh, diabetes, so glucose and insulin, but all the other things were the same too and, and had the same changes. But the blood glucose dropped significantly, the insulin dropped significantly, and the insulin um, resistance also um, dropped. So those are all very positive things for people with diabetes. So what's next? Um, well, we're, we don't know the mode of action of this. Um, we think there's probably many modes of action. It's probably just not one thing. Nature doesn't act you know, by doing just one thing different in a plant that you eat and it's, it's causing something that is all the um, blame for the effect either positive or negative. Usually it's a combination, and we, we think that this is probably no different. As I mentioned to you, we want to um, continue with our research in dementia. Um, we are right now finishing a gene regula regulation study. So in this study, this is actually blood taken from the um, diabetes study, and um, comparing the modern wheat diet with, a, with the Kamut diet, and looking at genes that were responsible for um, promoting the inflammation, the markers for inflammation. And what we found was they, uh, the people who were on modern wheat actually had, we found those genes were stimulated. They were acting, they were actually being turned on at a higher rate. With the Kamut, they were being suppressed. So their activity was, was diminished. So it was actually the the, the cytokines and, were, and on down at the end of the line, we're seeing infl inflammatory markers are being regulated at the gene cellular level, at, at the genes within the cell, which is, is as close to you know, the beginning as it gets. So this is having a very strong effect, even at the, the gene level, of regulating what is going on in your body. And so it must, it's probably affecting every cell. Um, because of that, um, and my being really convinced of the important link with inflammation as a marker for health and um, well-being, we're now working on an inflammatory index and creating an inflammatory index using cell cultures. These, these, these um, research studies that we have done, and they're not enormous as I told you, but they cost in the neighborhood of sixty to eighty thousand dollars a piece. Well, you can't. That's not an assay that you can go out and do. That's a lot of money. And uh, now we're developing a cell culture test. For $100, you can um, put a number on the inflammation index, we're going to call it, whether a food is inflammatory causing or anti-inflammatory um, uh, properties. And if we can put together an index that is reproducible, and then could be published so that people could use it all over the world. They could use this in plant breeding programs, for example, so that we could look at not only the yields and, the, and all these other things we're already looking at, but the nutrition in a very important way at looking at the inflammatory either index, whether it's pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. We could do the same thing with processing. We know that some processes increase inflammation in food. Some processes decrease inflammation in food. And to have that understanding could be revolutionary, I think, in, in food and in, in breeding programs. Um, the long-range goal, of course, is to reduce the cost and suffering of chronic disease. I could really get political really quick, but it doesn't, guess what, folks? It doesn't matter what kind of health care program you have in the country. If a significant percent of the population is sick, the country is going to go broke because no one can afford that. We can't afford to be sick. And if, as long as we're eating food that contributes to a sickness, we're never gonna return, turn this around with more pills. Um, pills are not the answer to this. Food is the answer, I'm convinced of that. And if we can designate what foods are really good for us and promote our health, 
and give those foods a label or some, somehow distinguish them, then we can get people to think more about um, buying them and eating them. So, in conclusion, I think we're paying a very high price for cheap food. And people don't think about that, but we don't pay it at the checkout counter. We pay little at the checkout counter. We pay it down the road. We pay it at the doctor's office. We pay it at lost work. We pay it at feeling crummy or getting sick. Um, that's how we pay for it. Um, wheat, which once was a staff of life, now has been changed so that bread is now very cheap but causes more harm than good for many people. Not everybody, but for many people. Um, it, <clears throat> it no longer increases antioxidant capacity. It's been changed from anti-inflammatory to promoting inflammation. It aggravates chronic disease rather than help reduce or prevent it. All wheat varieties should be tested, I think, um, and to see if they're inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And we should only grow and eat the anti-inflammatory weeds. And it's just not my wheat. My wheat, yeah, I showed you where we could grow it. It's a very teeny tiny portion of the world. We need to get all the weeds that we're growing generally in the world to look at this aspect of inflammation. And, um, and I don't intend to be involved with that. I just intend to try to promote it. Um, we should emphasize in breeding programs that there should be a focus on high nutrition rather than just on high yields. Um, and also, I think that we should emphasize and even processing, that we should, processing should be focusing on maintaining or improving nutrition rather than just cost cutting and um, getting, um, cost cutting at the expense of nutrition and just getting more food on the shelf that's uh, has, it's more shelf stable or just cheaper uh, without thinking about nutrition. And so I think that in final, my final point is this, let's eat our way to good health with good food and pay a little bit more at the checkout counter and save a lot at the health care facility wherever we go and also increase our well-being. So that's my pitch. I thank you very much for your time and eat well, be well, be thankful and be kind. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for questions. Who would like to start? Uh, earlier in your speech, you talked about how modern wheat was processed and how modern bread was made, fast rising yeast and so forth. And we've heard a lot about super refined white flour. Now, in these trials you mentioned, you were comparing modern wheat to your ancient wheat. Mm -hmm which is a different, uh, different variety, of course, but um, can you separate the actual differences between the two wheat types and then how they're handled in modern times, how they're processed and baked? Well, that's a very good question. We didn't, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible and avoid as many variables as possible. So both the ancient and modern wheat were organically grown we didn't want to bring that um, variable in, and they were both whole grain or semi-whole wheat, um, bread, uh, pasta, and um, crackers, and the flour. And with the irritable bowel syndrome tests, uh, we, they, they didn't want to give them whole wheat because they were afraid of aggravating their system and having dropouts. And so everything was toned down a little bit for that experiment, but the other experiments had at least some whole wheat um, in the experiment, but if it was whole wheat for modern wheat, it was, or for ancient wheat, it was also whole wheat for modern wheat. So we try to keep all of that the same. So we did not look at the question that you raised or the, or the statements that I made earlier. We haven't looked at those specifically to, to know the, the effect of white flour compared to whole wheat, for example. That's why I'm really excited about this possibility of a cell culture um, uh, inflammatory index because it could be done very simply, cheaply, and um, uh, quickly. And uh, you could then compare the same grain, uh, whole wheat and, and white flour. You could compare sourdough with um, fast rising yeast or even slower fermentations with longer fermentations. And all those things that mentioned that we don't really have numbers on yet, but there, are, um, there have been some research which indicates the, the, the trends. But I don't think anyone has, has been able to qualify, quantify that very well. Thank you. Yes? Are there any, currently any efforts in the organic food industry to lower prices? That's a very good question. Um, 
When you're talking about prices, um, and this is a very um, uh, near and dear subject of mine, so um, because I'm a farmer, and the farmers usually start with almost nothing. In fact, most of my neighbors now are going about to go broke because they're growing wheat with all these chemicals and everything that they can't sell for hardly anything. Um, it's like three and a half dollars a bushel. Um, meanwhile, the organic prices are like 15, so almost five times. That's a little extreme. Usually they've been two to three times or maybe even 80%, but double, they've been double, that's been normal. Um, when you um, uh, add the cost of your ingredient, however, something like bread, the wheat component is such a small percent that it really doesn't change the total price very much. What does change with the organic systems is the cost of handling and, and um, uh, making small amounts. And as organic gets more and more, now we're 5% or more of the total um, groceries in America is 5%. That's now starting to get to the um, scale of volume that we can take advantage of, of uh, transportation and you know, not shipping by the box, but shipping by the truckload to the factories and then to the stores and that sort of thing. That will help some. But food right now in this country is too cheap because what we're paying for is not enough of what we're needing. And one of the reasons it's that way is because of the drive to make food cheap. So if you, had a, if you had a Mercedes or just think about or a Porsche or something, the most expensive car that you can think of to own, would you put the cheapest oil you could find in that car? Would you put the cheapest gas you could find in that car? Would you put the cheapest antifreeze in that car? This is the most expensive car in the world. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Our bodies, compared to that, are an amazing machine. It can't be duplicated. And yet, we want to fuel that with the cheapest fuel we can find. This is completely insane. We should be fueling our bodies with the highest quality. It doesn't need to be $100,000 like a Porsche car. But it, it, we shouldn't complain if it costs twice as much. When we see our show tickets, what we spend on our entertainment has doubled and tripled and quadrupled, and hardly anybody complains about that. But when the food doubles, you think that it's almost a riot. And yet what we need to do, in my mind, is to link the value of the food to real value in nutrition. You can't just be in a nice wrapper and say organic and say, we can have an organic Twinkie, for heaven's sakes. So, you know, we have to be careful where we're going with this. But now I'm also sensitive to people that don't have a big food budget. So people that don't have big food budgets can also eat organic if they eat a little lower on the, on the, um, on the hog as far as processing goes. If they would go to the store and buy um, grain, uh, for example, and go home and make their own bread or make their own pancakes or, or butter it up and put it in pilafs, they could eat very cheaply. I have, we, may, we have hot cereal at our home every oh, once or twice a week, especially in the winter. The Kamut sells on the, on the it's probably a dollar a pound. It's, it's very expensive. But for a dollar a pound, you only need um, an eighth of a pound to have, make a full portion. That's, t that's 12 cents, 12 and a half cents, an eighth of a dollar. So for 12 and a half cents, you can make a, a big portion, a whole meal. 12 and a half cents. That's something that anybody can afford, I think. But if you go and buy you know, the, the, the box of uh, prepared cereal, you're in a completely different uh, category for cost. And it's less nutritious in a lot of cases than fresh uh, ground grain boiled for porridge. So those are some of the things you can do. I don't know if I answered your question too well on that, but that's, that's, that's how I would look at it. Um, if you look at the, the extreme high cost of organic, it will moderate, but please don't expect it to go to cheap food mentality. Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Yes? Is anybody looking at the same kind of phenomenon with corn? That's a really good question. And I just last um, March in the food show in, in Anaheim I went to, the same one that we started going to 30 years ago, met a, um, a, a lady who was working for a nonprofit group with ancient corns. And they are, so I haven't got together with them, but we're going to get together and compare notes. And the other um, crop that I'm working, I found at the same show, a fellow working with rice. 
So if you look at corn and rice and wheat, you're looking at the major crops throughout the world. And if we could show similar things, that would really strengthen this story and the argument. And that would, we're really interested in that. Would you, would you also be able to test that with that uh, inflammatory? That's the idea. So you don't have to go through. We've spent, gosh, we're spending almost $200,000 a year in research. We can't do this forever. But, um, and if you have to start over with corn and rice, if we could use some basic evidence that we already have and say we can extrapolate now to the cell culture test, then you could do many, many tests for very little money and very quickly. So I'm hoping so, but that's a good question. Any other questions? How are we doing for time? Okay, okay, I didn't see the hand. Where is it? Who, who had a, oh, over at the top. Well, I was kind of like responding and kind of asking questions, but doesn't the price also like organic foods also reflect like the consumer's choice? Because like if we have, if more people bought it, when it when the price go down? Yes, yes. It's through, well, like it's not just, it's not the farmer's choice to like lower the price. It's like we have to rise to the demand, like we have to rise to the demand as well. Like, the demand right now, for, particularly for spring wheat, um, and the commute acres are in the overlapping in this region that I showed you. And I don't know how many are familiar with Dave's Killer Bread, but they are in our backyard. They're from their company now. Um, well, they're owned by a big company. But they started out in Portland, and they are drawing a significant amount of spring wheat out of the same region that we're fighting over acres for our commute, um, Coruscant wheat. And we are... Um, in a bidding war with them. And so instead of, our, our prices have been, um, oh, eight to 10 to $12 for years, and now we're at 25 to $28 a bushel to the farmers. And so if you compare $28 compared to three for a conventional wheat, that's huge. But meanwhile, the um, uh, organic spring wheat, uh, in this case, is being paid over $20 a bushel. And because it yields more than ours by a significant amount, we, we have to always be ahead uh, above that. So that has pushed the raw material price up quite significantly. But the raw materials I mentioned to you earlier is usually a minor portion of the total cost. But when you get up that much, it does affect the, the total cost, especially in something like pasta where it's the main ingredient, um, or flour where it's the only ingredient. <laughs> Um, for bread, where you have many ingredients, it, 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 it moderates that a little bit. So you've got different things. You have also the supply and demand that's affecting this. And we have, if you guys have any farmer friends or family that are still trying to make a living with a chemical agriculture and wondering how they're going to meet their payments at the bank, encourage them to look at organic. Just start out small. Because we have, in this country right now, 5%, as I mentioned to you, of the food is organically produced, but only 1% of the farmers are organic. Um, so we are inviting ex imports into the country that are getting big prices and big money that our farmers could be having. And that would help um, stabilize and, and, and help the prices too. Yes? Uh, my family farms up in Ledgers, and we have about 4,000 acres, and there we do spray wheat, and we do lots of. Lots of types of crops, but there's, I've talked to my brother about organic who runs our farm, and he said there's no way financially with no irrigation and the type of resistance you have with weeds right now to, for our, our family to financially be able to, to do organic. So my, my question is how, how would you make that step if you did want to do organic? Because at this point, the, the cost you put in for, you know, your, your seed and your and not having irrigation, that it ends up being really financially a burden if you try to do organic. Well, <clears throat> I wish I had brought my organic talk. Because um, <laughs> I have a chart in there that when you're talking about cost, so my farm is in Big Sandy, which is not far from Ledger. It's dry land. We don't have any irrigation. It's 4,000 acres. That's the size of our farm. Um, I started my organic conversion with 20 acres. And I started on the alfalfa field that we turned under, and, we, and that was my organic start. Um, side by side to that 20 acres was 20 acres of chemical farm ground that um, we added. We did soil tests, and we added 
nitrogen to that chem chemical form the same level as my organic nitrogen levels with the alfalfa, which is pretty high with alfalfa because it's the best um, legume. And you leave it in several years and it builds up the nitrogen better than any other legume. So when we, when we went to do our yield tests, they were almost the same. That year we had decent rains and we had about 35 to 36 bushel, almost one or two bushel difference. Um, the protein was higher in the organic one, just a little bit. Um, but again, it wasn't significant. And the weeds, and you, when you're talking about weeds, at that time we were using 14 inch spacing in our winter wheat drills um, to catch snow, big, to make big um, 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 furrows to catch snow. And all my neighbors said, oh, that seven inch spacing you're using for your organic field is all gonna die because it won't catch enough snow. Well, it didn't die. And so like, there again, it's the tradition. And these aren't that old the traditions, but the tradition is you have to do it this way or that way and that way. If you're talking about weed control now, the chemical guys are the ones having the trouble because of the resistance of those weeds to chemicals. That's a, organic doesn't, we don't have that problem. Our weed problems are now mostly weeds that are the easiest to kill with chemicals and we control them with rotations. So remember when I said earlier that diversity um, begets stability? When you look at the pasture, you don't see monoculture out there. When you look at the, the uh, river bottoms, when you look at the forest right here, there's no monoculture. It's completely diverse. All those different plants and grasses and shrubs and bushes all are adding something or taking something from that system that keeps it um, really robust. And to make organic work, we just duplicate that. Not at all at the same time, but through rotations. We rotate the same. I mean, we do yellow peas and then like rotate with chickpeas. We rotate. Great. Well, you're halfway there. You're halfway there. So my, but the part of the land we got was from a neighbor who had, who didn't do take care of their weeds and now they're kosher. It's completely out of control. Mm -hmm. And then you have neighbors who then do the same and then they end up using paraquat. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Causes, you know, you're increasing your resistance. So, yep. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a never ending you know, cycle with the chemicals. And how do you pay for those chemicals? With weed at $3.50, how do you pay for those chemicals? It's the chemical agriculture that's not paying for itself, not the organic. The organic is the only thing that's paying for itself. And then I had a really nice chart showing the last 50 years in the triangle, so from Great Falls to Haver to Cut Bank, for those that might not know where the triangle is. Um, they did a chart showing gross um, uh, income and then um, gross expenses. And the, the net was zero for the last 50 years. They were, they were not comparing organic and non This is just a chemical farm. It's the only thing that was keeping those farmers alive were the government programs. They were paying subsidies that were above their um, profit of zero, and that kept them alive. Now we have a different program, and we don't have that anymore. So now the farmers in really serious situation, they're chemical farmers with cheap wheat to sell. It doesn't pay their bills. And so I would tell people, don't start with the whole farm, start with 10% and do what you're already doing with your rotations. Um, we have a nine year rotation on our farm that, uh, that rotates not only the cash crops, which we have five, but we have four different legume crops that go in between those cash crops. So if they're clovers or alfalfas or peas or buckwheat, um, they all fit in between the winter wheat and the spring wheat and the, we do um, oil, sapphire oil. Do you know if you guys eat in, the, in your cafeterias here, you're eating our sapphire oil, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. And um, uh, anyway, that's, that, it can be done. So the fallacy is not that organic costs too much. The fallacy, the truth is that chemical farming costs too much. So that's what we need to say. Yes? Well, I was intrigued by what you said about the uh, mode of action determination. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? I mean, so, you know, you, as you pointed out, it's not just weed. So how are you studying that? How are you studying the interface between weed and other kinds of things? So what do you have in mind in that? In that well, that's pretty complex. I agree. <laughs> and that's why we really have really such high hopes for this a cell culture test, because then you could do many, many tests and look at many variables for a very cheap uh, price because I don't have enough. And that's, and that's another reason we're wanting to come to America now, that we have 20 publications and saying we think that this is enough evidence um, to say that there's something going on here that would justify a multi-million dollar study over several years with several hundred people. 
and that would be broad-based, however. But the question you're asking is really not the broad-based um, um, question, but the very specific mode of action one. And that's very, that's very complicated. How, what, can, what is controlling the gene function, for example? Sometimes that can be uh, easily isolated, and sometimes it's a, it's a complex that's going on that if you take out one piece or you change another piece, it's not acting quite the same. So I don't know, that's going to be um, a lot of work, but I'm hoping with, if we can do a cell culture test and have a way to look at many variables in, in very quickly for not too much money, then we can unravel that. Okay, one last question. Yes. Yeah. Maybe two. Uh, uh, I really appreciate the canoe frames. They were really popular when I ran my bakery and catering business. About 70% of people who are wheat intolerant have no problem at all with mm -hmm. that. And my canoe raisin bread was my best weekend specialty seller. Oh, great. And, but I also noticed a lot of people uh, I used alternative grains, alternative sweeteners, but I, I also offered the wheat Montana products after finding, uh, again, about 70% of people mm -hmm. who said they were wheat intolerant would go ahead and try, whether it was kinesiology testing or whatever, and try mm -hmm. the wheat Montana. And same statistics there, they generally didn't seem to react to it. Have you ever noted any index, inflammation index studies on the wheat Montana? No, but what's, that's what we're hoping with this cell culture test. We can do that easily. Um, and that's the number, that, the 70% number, we, our very first studies with people who were very severely affected by wheat, that's the same number we had. There was about 72, 75% that said they, they were very seriously affected, they had no trouble at all. The others are mostly, some of them couldn't tell any difference, I mean, they're just, they were just affected the same. But a lot of the other 25% were less affected. And some, some of our research has been done with people who've been off wheat for a long period of time. And more of them can eat the kamut than modern wheat. If they eat the modern wheat, they'll get sick almost immediately. And with most of them on the kamut, they, they're better for a much longer period of time and if they'll rotate it with other grains or rice or something else, then they last longer. But some of them just they're, they're have a weakness in their system that's not completely healed. So that, Okay, last question. Well, I have a basic question for you. First of all, thank you very much for this presentation. And if I wanted to bake a loaf of bread and use your product with some sourdough or a, a slow rising yeast, because you know you got to put all these pieces together, where can I find your product? Well, the Good Food Store has a, has a flour. And do you still have your bakery going? Yeah, yeah, I used to. No, I used to have. It oh. Before. Do you know where she can find sourdough starter? And you can find you can buy it in the store, right? When I understand her, the yeah. food company or good food store, those were two places that mm -hmm. I used to get the products all the time available. And if you're really adventurous, you can make your own sourdough start <laughs> with white flour and put it out on the porch. Okay. And, and you can go on the internet and find out all about that, but it takes a little more patience. <laughs> well, okay. I just happen to have... No, I'm not, you're going to have to split these up because they told me that there are fewer people that normally come and came. So I've got some little um, uh, Kamut uh, treats. And if some of you want to split a, a bag with some of your best friends, I, I have about 25 and I think there's over 30 here. So um, please help yourself until they're gone. So thanks again. Join me once again in thanking you for the